In the last video, we talked about how quantities in nature are described using units. Physical quantities like mass, volume, and time are completely specified by their magnitude only, or how big or how great their values are. Say, you have 50 kilograms of rice, or your body temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius, you complete one meter dash for six seconds. In physics, we call these values scalar quantities. Examples of these quantities are time, distance, mass, area, density, work, temperature, speed, among others. The other type of quantity is called a vector quantity. Unlike a scalar quantity, vector quantities have both magnitude, or how great the measurement is, and direction where the magnitude is going. But let us have those later in this video. An easy part of the scalar quantity is that it can be added and subtracted, multiplied and divided like ordinary numbers. Say, a 3 kilogram of sand is added to 1 kilogram of cement. The resulting mixture is 4 kilograms. Or when 5 liters of water are poured from a pail that has 8 liters, the resulting volume is 3 liters. Or if your scheduled trip has a 15 minute delay, the trip takes 75 minutes. In each of these cases, no direction is involved. We see that the description such as 10 kilograms north or 5 liters east or 15 minutes south have no meaning, right? However, combining vectors require a different set of operations. First, we need to understand the anatomy of a vector quantity. Usually, an arrow is used to represent the magnitude and direction of a vector quantity where the bad is the magnitude of the vector. We cannot just randomly draw an arrow though. The length of the arrow must be drawn using scales to indicate the magnitude of the vector quantity. What does it mean? If we want to represent my 60 meter displacement from point A to point B, then we will use an appropriate scale, say 1 centimeter is to 15 meter. Then, that is when we can draw the magnitude of the arrow. Notice that in our example, from point A to point B, we are heading east. So the head of our vector representation is towards east too. Now, it is very important that you put label on your vectors so you will not be confused when two or more vectors are present in your problem. We can do this by assigning a variable, say letter A, with an arrow on top of it. This arrow on top here shows that the variable A is a vector quantity. If there's none, that means it is a scalar quantity. And most of the problems in physics involves a combination of both scalar and vector quantities, so better to represent them well. Suppose there's an airplane slowly flying north at 100 km per hour relative to the surrounding air. We would represent this velocity vector by 1 cm is equal to 20 km per hour. Since it is flying north, the direction of the arrow is going north. Then, we would label it A with an arrow on top of it. Below this plane, there is a tailwind which blows north at a velocity of 20 km per hour. Here, I would represent it following our chosen scale. 1 cm is equal to 20 km per hour, and then an arrow going north, and then we will label it with vector B. We see here that these two vectors are in the same direction with one another. So with the tailwind, the airplane travels 120 kilometers in one hour relative to the ground below. Without the tailwind, it will travel in its original velocity, 100 km per hour. Such vectors that go into the same direction are called parallel vectors. Suppose that the airplane makes a U-turn and flies into the wind rather than with the wind. The airplane still flying at 100 km per hour and opposite to it is wind velocity at 20 km per hour. In this case, the total velocity of the airplane will be decreased to 80 km per hour because it is flying now against the wind. Such vectors are called anti-parallel vectors. Once again, the magnitude of the resultant vector C of two vectors A and B in parallel direction can be computed by getting its algebraic sum. Vector A plus B is equal to C and just copy the direction of where these vectors are heading. 
For anti-parallel vector, the resultant vector can be computed by getting the absolute value when you subtract vector A to vector B, and the direction of the resultant vector is dependent on the vector with higher magnitude. When we need to add more than two vectors, we may first find the vector sum of any two, add this vectorially to the third, and so on. For example, there was a storm forming due north of a small plane. That is why the pilot decided to make a U-turn. In our example, there's a tailwind with 20 km per hour velocity, and the north wind is also 20 km per hour, which we would design as vector C. To find the total vector, we may add vector A and C because they are in the same direction, which is due south, then we will algebraically add our vector B, which is in opposite direction at 20 km per hour. Our total vector, or the vector sum of the airplane, is still 100 km in one hour. Remember that parallel and anti-parallel vectors are only applicable for collinear vectors, or vectors lying in the same line. How about, instead of going south, the same airplane, which is heading north at 100 km per hour, is caught in a strong crosswind of 60 km per hour blowing from west to east. The tendency of the plane is to fly north but due east. This graph here shows us the vector of the airplane and the wind velocity. Notice that these two vectors are perpendicular with one another. To add two vectors forming right angle, we could use the Pythagorean theorem. Again, this states that the square of the hypotenuse of a right triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. In this case, our hypotenuse is our resultant vector. Let us apply the volumes in this formula. C squared, which is our resultant, equals to 100 km per hour squared, which is the velocity of the plane, and 60 km per hour squared, which is the velocity of the wind. When we perform this, we will get C squared equals 13,600 km squared over R squared. Then to eliminate the square for resultant vector, we would find the square root of both sides of the equation. And so the resultant velocity would be 116.62 km per hour. The next question would be, in which direction? Remember that in our graph, the final vector is somewhere here between north and east. We want to know how much angle did the airplane deflect from its original direction north after it is caught by the strong wind heading east. A little trigonometry will be helpful. Let us use a tangent function, opposite side over adjacent side. In your math class, we know that this is our opposite side because this side here is the opposite of the angle you want to know. Then the longest one, the diagonal one, the resultant vector is the hypotenuse and therefore the remaining one will be the adjacent side. Let us perform the operation now. In your calculator, you punch in shift tan, then type in the numbers 60 over 100, and we will get 30.9 or 31 degrees. This means the airplane is traveling at 31 degrees east of north. Now, a lot of you would ask, sir, why is it east of north and not north of east? Let us look at the graph that we did. Our zero degree is in north axis. And because of the strong wind, the airplane flew 31 degrees east. But since our frame of reference, that is our zero angle, is north, then we say that our final angle and direction is 31 degrees east of north. If we want to use east, the direction of the wind, as our frame of reference, we can simply subtract 31 from 90 degrees to get 59 degrees. Once again, from north axis going to east, the final vector of the plane is 116.62 km per hour, 31 degrees east of north. And here, if we choose east as our frame of reference, the airplane's final vector would be 116.62 km per hour, 59 degrees north of east. For those who are still confused, 
Notice as well the direction after the preposition of. That means that is your chosen frame of reference and where your vector is going. What we had so far in this video is a difference between the scalar and vector quantities. We also tackle how to add vectors in parallel and anti-parallel directions and the application of Pythagorean in finding vector sum of vectors forming right triangle. That is all for this video. I am Gilmar De Castro and see you in the next video.